Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. So, a lot of things going on in the news this week, huh? This past Friday, particularly, as the Supreme Court uh, made their ruling, any number of you have sent in messages, and you've uh, been asking all sorts of uh, questions. How is this going to affect uh, Christianity? How is it going to affect the church? And on and on and on. Great questions, all very uh, appropriate uh, sorts of questions. Let me just say a brief word, and, and that is, uh, keep in mind that Christians have never drawn uh, their cues spiritually from the government. We've always drawn our cues from God's word. And so that doesn't change. Uh, Now, having said that, let me also say, it is in God's word, where we draw the cues, that we also see our savior, Jesus, who comes onto the stage of history, into this world of brokenness and hurt and pain and confusion and all, and he lives a life full of truth and full of grace. And that is how Faithbridge has always sought to live as well for 16 years, and that's how we'll continue uh, to live, full of grace and full of truth after the example of our Lord Jesus. Now, there's more things to say about it, sure, and some of you are saying, I'd like for you to talk a little bit more about it. Here's what we're going to do. Instead of me cutting in on Ben Stewart's preaching time, since I know many of you have come with excitement to hear Ben, the way we're going to do it is I'm going to sit in uh, to do the postscript recording, the little recording that we do, for you, typically Q&As about the sermon. But today, I'm going to sit in and do that one, and you can join in to the many people who've already sent texts in from the early service. You have questions that you would like for me to talk about. We will talk about that, and we just thought that might be a better forum for having that kind of conversation than uh, trying to do it right here. And like I said, uh, Ben's here, and that's always a treat to hear him bring a word, and it's a great word that he has for us. So with that, uh, <clears throat> you send your messages in, and we should have that loaded up hopefully by this evening, and you can watch that interview then. Um, but right now, why don't we um, turn our attention to God's word and welcome Ben Stewart as he comes to preach to us right now. Yeah. Hey, good to see you guys. Uh, if you have a Bible, we are in Psalm chapter two, uh, and I want to read to you uh, the psalm, and we'll pray, and then uh, jump into it together. Psalm chapter two. So, glad you guys made it. Is it still raining out there? Is it still? No, no? we're okay. I drove in at five this morning and was getting flash flood warnings the whole way that were telling me, get off the roads, get out of this area. And I was like, Lord, if it be your will, I will preach. Uh, And uh, we made it. So Psalm chapter two, beginning in verse one, says this. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. 
Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let me pray for us. Lord, I want to thank you for everybody here and thank you for this moment to look at your word together and to talk about what you're like and what it's like to intersect with you in the brief time you've given us to live. And Lord, I just pray this morning you would lay open your word to us, not just so we could understand it, but so we could know you better through your word, that we'd understand what you think, how you feel, what you're doing. And then, God, I pray you would lay us bare as well, that you would convict, you would comfort, you would change as you see fit. And so I'm just asking you, Lord, to carry us along in this moment by your spirit as we look at your word. And I just want to ask you, if you're willing, to take a minute and ask him that. Say, Lord, will you teach us together today? And then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, some of you may have just heard the psalm I read and thought, what was that? Like, uh, I came to church for some comfort, some encouragement. You're talking about kings raging and God smashing people and laughing. What on earth was that about? Why would you pick that? Well, last time I was here, uh, I started teaching through and want to pick up now a series on the Psalms. And when you do a series on the Psalms, which that word just means song, uh, when you look at the songs of the Old Testament, there's 150 of them in the book. And you go, how do you know which ones to pick? Like, if you're going to do a series on Psalms, you can't do all 150. So what are you going to do? And at that point, you got to pick a sifting criteria. And I could have picked just Ben's favorite playlist of songs, but I thought nobody needs that. Uh, So what other criteria would I use? And what I decided to do was to take this Old Testament songbook, and, and, and they were written over the course of centuries, from as old as Moses up through David. And you've got through it, Uh, the New Testament church, the people of Jesus, really came around these psalms and would sing these psalms, and some songs rose to the top more than others, and that's what was interesting to me. What songs did the people of Jesus gravitate to? What songs did the people of Jesus, would they have put on their top 10 list, would have put on their mix for the summer? What are the psalms? Because there are about 60 plus psalms that are quoted well over 140 times in the New Testament. What are the songs that the church gravitated to, the people of Jesus cling to, the songs that were on their lips as they walked with him? And I wanted to pick the top ones. And this one is one of, by far, the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. And my question is, why? Why this song? about smashing the nations and kissing people. What's going on with this? Well, every song, not just the Bible, every song that exists is a reaction to something. I mean, think about your favorite songs. Every song is a reaction to something. That's why you write one. I fell in love, so I write a song. They broke up with me, so I write a song. You know, and uh, we all have songs. We come around for different things to express our emotions about something that's occurring. And this song, the reason it appealed to the early church and the reason it's relevant to us, because it was a song about how to handle stress, or more specifically, how to respond to chaos. How am I supposed to think and how am I supposed to feel when the world seems out of control? That's the question. How does the Christian operate in the middle of chaos? And and that mattered to them, and it matters to us, because all of us have been in situations that feel out of control, that forces outside of us are determining things and making decisions that affect us, and we can't control those people. We've all felt that and felt the natural fear that rises up when you say external forces are bearing in on my future, and I can't control that. We've all felt the fear of that, and how do you respond to that? And for some of you, this is very personal stuff, that you look and you go, I'm applying to this school and I don't know, I need that person to say yes about my future. Or you go, my company's downsizing and I'm out of control of my family's fate. Or maybe it's a medical issue and you go, I'm out of control here. And you feel that fear that comes in in the midst of chaos. Or some of us, it's not you personally right now, but you just watch the news. And you see it didn't get as much play this week, but 
terrorist attacks all over the world, coordinated for the time of Ramadan, 36 murdered while vacationing on the beach in Tunisia, 37 more injured. You look in South Carolina and you say someone walks into a church with a gun and just starts killing people. What do I do when this world feels absolutely out of control? When the unknown and uncertainty come bearing in on me, how does the Christian respond? That's the question. And this psalm helps us. And it's broken into four sections, and I'm going to zoom through them. And the first one, if you notice, the scene is chaotic, and it's meant to feel chaotic. Nations are raging, peoples are plotting, kings want to cast off restraint. And you go, what's going on here? Well, in the original context of the Old Testament, God's people, the people of God in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, God put them in the center of the nations. If you look geographically, whenever a people come to God, God never sequesters them in a safe little hamlet. He always puts them right in the middle of the culture. And he put his people right in the middle of the nations surrounding them and said, I want you to be a kingdom of priests. That is, you're a kingdom that has one hand on God and one hand on the people that don't know me. That's what a priest does. I'm trying to connect the world to God. That's what I'm doing. And he says, I want a kingdom that helps people know God and listen to God and obey God and enjoy God, to love him and love others. That's the idea. And they were meant to be a people who do that. And yet what happens here in this psalm is as the nations are around them, the kingdom is having a transition of kings. And you see, rather than nations joining them in the worship of God, they want to rebel. And you see, it says, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let's burst their bonds and cast away their cords. This is what's called a coronation psalm. It's the arrival of a new king. It's a vulnerable point at the time of a nation. And here as the king arrives, rather than the nations rallying around and bowing to him and saying, we agree, we follow you as you connect us to God, the nations want to rebel. They don't want to be obligated to him. They don't want to be obligated to a god or some other king. They say, we want to cast off anyone telling us what to do. And you go, well, how does that apply to us? Well, it's basically this. It's a terrifying thing when people with power cast off moral restraint. It's a terrifying thing. It is. When a parent decides, I'm not going to be bound by any external morality above me. I'm going to do whatever I want. That's terrifying. Kids get abused that way. When men in a society say, I'm not going to bind myself to any kind of social governing above me. I'm going to do whatever I want. It's terrifying. Women lose that way. When governments say, I don't care about what's happening with these people. I'm going to do whatever I want. It's terrifying. Read the newspaper. There's all kinds of people being slaughtered around the world today because the people with the guns don't care and have no moral restraint that would keep them from slaughtering their own people. It's a terrifying thing when the person with the power in the room doesn't care to hold themselves accountable to one who has a moral obligation. It's a terrifying thing. It's meant to feel chaotic. It's meant to feel scary. And some of us can feel that. Every time a bomb goes off or a gun gets shot into a church, we go, oh my God, it's out of control. This is chaos. How am I supposed to respond to this? What do we do in the midst of chaos? And the answer is, in the midst of the chaos, we look up and we see the true king. Because they look scary, people with power without any moral obligation. But, in verse 4, he who sits in the heavens, literally the one whose throne is in heaven. So you got all these kings on their thrones rebelling, but the one whose throne is in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. And the point there is the people with power over you that you don't control can seem scary to you, but they're not scary to him. They're not a threat to God. The people that we can be afraid of in our little worlds, he's not afraid of. It says their power, the combined power of the kings is funny to him. It's like being attacked by a baby. It's not really a contest. I remember my brother was telling me the story of when his little she wasn't even a year old uh, daughter, changing her diaper, and she didn't want her diaper changed. And so she just started kicking him, like trying to kick him away. And he was just laughing because he was like, it's just so like, I don't, it, like it's not bad. She's, it's not good. She's rebelling against her dad. But it is like funny that she thinks she's like, she's going to win. 
she's like kicking away his hand. Like at some point I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Just do whatever you want. You know, like I can't, I can't overcome the power of this little six month old. You know, he was just like, it's not good that she's rebelling or whatever, but it is kind of sweet that she thinks like this will have any other alternative than the inevitable, which is I'm going to get my way. And that diaper is getting changed, right? And so what terrifies us doesn't terrify God. It doesn't. But God, you don't know my boss. Yeah, I'm not scared of your boss. Well, God, you don't know what that person's capable of. Yeah, I'm not scared of that person. Well, God, they're the most popular people at my school. Yeah, I'm not real scared of your junior high. I'm not. (laughs) That what legitimately will terrify us sometimes when you look up beyond them, the king in heaven is not concerned about their power. There's one who rules over all the kings, no matter how much they rage. But he's not laughing at evil. He's not sort of goofy about injustice when he sees that in the world. He cares. And so in verse 5, it says, then he will speak to them in his wrath. God is angry at sin. And he will terrify them in his fury. As for me, saying, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. He's angry about sin, but his response isn't to come after them. His response is, I'm establishing a king. I'm bringing a king. You may be kings, I'm bringing my king. And then the king speaks in verse seven and says, I will tell of the decree. I'm gonna tell you what God told me. And he says, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Now in its Old Testament context, when God pulled his people out of Egypt and made them the people of God in the Old Testament, he says, you're gonna be like my my kid. You're like my son. And I will through you bless the nations. And then as that became a kingdom under a king, he said that king, as he represents the people, the king will be my son. I will treat him as a son. And he will rule my people as they're a light of God to the nations. That was the idea, right? And so the reality is God says, I'm giving my power to the son. Now, that doesn't mean the guy was begotten. That, like, he wasn't born that day. But God's saying, that's the one that rules my people as their ministers to the world. And then as God speaks to this king, it says, ask of me, I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. What he's saying is the authority of God will go to my king and that king rules and no other kingdom's gonna stand in his presence. That God will establish his king and no one else is going to rival him will be triumphant. It's not even a contest. And he compares it to a battle between an iron rod and pottery. In a battle of iron versus pottery, iron always wins. There's no scenario where pottery is going to pull it out. Well, what if I hit the pot with the iron? Iron wins. Well, what if I set the iron down and hit it with the pot? Iron wins. What if a bunch of pots get together with guns? It doesn't matter. Iron's going to win. That's it. That's all. And so my king will rule. And yet here's the interesting thing is the psalm ends. What do you expect is going to happen? The kings are raging. These people are victimized by it. They look up and say, but our king is in the heavens. He does what pleases him. He's sending an anointed one. And that anointed one has power over the nations. What do you expect to hear next? So buckle up, son, because the thunder's coming, right? (laughs) You expect to hear him go, now you're going to get it. My boyfriend's back. (laughs) You expect to hear some kind of like, and now comes judgment. Now comes destruction. Take that, kings. But what do you get? You get the opposite. You get grace. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Rather than the people of God mocking these kings who are rebelling against God, what do the people of God do? They begin to plead with the kings for their life. They say, don't do this. Your rebelling against him isn't isn't good for you. It's not good for your kingdom. It's not good for the world. Don't do this. This isn't a fight you can win. And they don't say that with any mockery or laughing in their tone. They say, it's not a fight you can win. Repent. Come back. Kiss the sun. Take refuge from the anger of God against sin. Where? In God. 
Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. The God who's angry at sin wants to embrace you, the rebel, and take you in, and you'll be blessed when you kiss the sun. Come to him. And you see, there's not this arrogance. There's compassion that rises up. When we know our king is powerful, it brings out compassion in them. It's interesting. I don't know if you saw the movie Captain Phillips. Um, it it's, tells the story of a true life event of uh, a U.S. ship that was taken captive by Somali pirates. They pulled Captain Phillips off the ship. They took him as a hostage. The movie depicts that. There's debate on the accuracy of the movie. I don't really care for the point of this illustration. If you watch the movie starring Tom Hanks, there's this moment where he's taken captive by these Somali pirates and there's that famous scene where they're standing over him with the guns and one of them looks at him and says, I'm the captain now. I'm the captain now. I run this place. And then what happens? The U.S. Navy pulls up in a warship. And the most interesting thing happens, this captain held captive by these men doesn't start going, now you're gonna get it. Here come the seal, son, ooh, right? He doesn't do that. What does he do? He looks at the inevitability of the power of U.S. military might, and he looks at these men, and what does it bring out of his heart? Arrogance? No, compassion. He says, don't do this. He says, what you're doing now is gonna make everybody lose here. Put the guns down. There will be refuge for you. There'll be safety for you. They'll be welcoming for you, but repent, put it down, don't do this. And he starts to plead with them for their life. It brings out of him compassion, not judgment, right? Now, why did the church quote this? Why did the New Testament people of God rally around this psalm? Because in the Old Testament, no king of Israel really fully embodied this song by any stretch. And what they figured out pretty quick, if you read the Bible, is this is talking about not just a king, the next king. It's talking about like a capital K king a capital A, anointed one. That anointed one in Hebrew is the word Messiah. In Greek, it's the word Christ. So they read this and like, we're looking for the one true king, the king, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. And so when Jesus showed up on the scene at his baptism at the beginning of his ministry, God spoke from heaven and says, you are my son. At Jesus' transfiguration, at the center point of his ministry, God spoke from heaven to Jesus' disciples and says, this is my son. And then Paul tells us in the book of Romans that Jesus Christ was promised beforehand in the Holy Scriptures concerning the son who was a descendant from David, that was the one true king of Israel, according to the flesh, but he was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. He says it was at the end of Jesus' ministry when he died for our sin and was buried and then beat death that Paul says he was declared with power. This is the son of God. This is the king, the anointed one, the ruler. That's why when Jesus rose, he told his disciples, all authority has been given over to me. That Jesus wasn't just a moral teacher, isn't just a good guy, isn't someone trying to give you tips to improve your life. That the biblical presentation of Jesus Christ is he is the king over everyone and everything. And that if I want peace with God, I kiss the son. I come to Jesus Christ and I bow to him because we're all rebels, we're all running. And the good news is rather than crushing us as we try to cast off his fetters, what does he do? He comes to us and says, come to me, join me. Blessed are those who take refuge in me. So how do we apply that here? I would say, one, if you don't know Jesus Christ, kiss the son, come to him. We don't believe he's a moral teacher, good guy, nice person. We believe he is God's son who rules all things. All of us are rebels. In the Christian system, the kings that are casting off their bonds and running away are all of us. All of us have tried to be little kings of our little life and said, forget you, God, I'm doing whatever I want with my body, my decisions, my life, my sexuality, it's mine to control. Forget you, God, we've all done that and are all like one another under his wrath. But God has provided a way for refuge from the wrath of God in the Son of God. 
that he came to live the perfect life. We could not die the death we deserved, and he draws us in, kiss the son, find refuge in him, and be blessed in doing so. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, that's who he is to us. When we say, I'm a Christian, we say, my allegiance is to the king. I bow to him, and I have kissed the son. He runs this place, and I bow to him, knowing that I am blessed in doing so. And I would beg you to do that. Now, for those of us who know Jesus Christ, what does that mean for us? Well, it inspires a few things. Calm, confidence, and compassion. It makes us calm in the middle of the chaos of life. That's where the psalm starts. Why do the nations rage in vain? They said no matter what these other authorities do, they're not gonna win. And so the Christian becomes calm. No matter what happens in your world, no matter what authority comes against you, ultimately your king wins and that's a stabilizer to the Christian church. The Roman emperor Diocletian, centuries into Christianity, third, fourth century, I don't remember which, he set up two sp- pillars in Spain. And let me read to you what he put on the pillars. Diocletian, who hated Christianity, wanted to stamp it out, put this on the first pillar. Diocletian, Jovian, Maximus, Hercules, Caesar, Augusti. That was his name. For having extended the Roman Empire in the east and the west and having extinguished the name of Christian who brought the republic to ruin. The second pillar, and these were built in his honor by him, says, Diocletian, Jovian, Maximum, Hercules, Caesar, Augusti, for having everywhere abolished the superstition of Christ and extended the worship of the gods. It's the pillars he erected as a champion of his victory over Christ. What's the irony of that? Maybe one of you in this room had ever heard of Diocletian, Jovian, Maximum, Augusti, Caesar before I mentioned it in this very moment but you've all heard the name of Jesus Christ. Align yourself against him, you're not gonna win. And so no matter what comes against the Christian, we can be calm, we don't panic, our guy reigns. It makes us calm, it makes us confident. In Acts chapter four, when they were imprisoned for their faith and set free, this is the song they sang. The nations are raging in vain against the sovereign Lord. He runs all this, and so it says they preach the gospel with more boldness. They said, even though we're being arrested for our faith, these kings that are arresting us don't ultimately win. So we can be confident. But did that make them arrogant? Did that make them cruel? No, it made them compassionate because we know we were rebel kings too and he came for us. All of us are rebels and God saves. And so when they went out to a world that rebelled against Christ, they didn't say, you just wait till he brings the thunder. They called them to receive the blessing of the king. So Polycarp, one of the first Christian martyrs, Bishop of Smyrna. They were killing Christians, made it a sport, pulled people into the arena, were murdering them, and they told him, you gotta get out of here. He didn't wanna leave his people, but the Christians don't court death, and so he let his people take them away and hide him in a farmhouse. They found him, and when he, they found out where he was, he didn't run, he waited. And when the soldiers kicked in the door, thought they would have to search for him, they didn't. He was standing there waiting for them. And he said to them, and you can read it all, I won't read it all to you, in the martyrdom of Polycarp, that he was waiting there for them, and he ordered food and water to be brought. He said, you gotta be tired from the journey. That is the journey to come arrest him to kill him. And so he offered them a meal, they sat down, they ate, they drank, and he prayed over them as they sat and ate and drank. The soldiers, here to take him to the Colosseum to be murdered. And it says, those who heard him were amazed and they regretted that they had come for such a godly man. They started to regret the decision because he was acting so strange to these soldiers. Not cowering, not freaking out, not angry, no fear, no anger. He cooks them a meal and is kind to them and prays for them. They bring him into the stadium, people are screaming. They call him to repent. They say, swear the oath and we will release you. Revile Christ. And Polycarp said, for 86 years I have been his servant and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And the proconsul said, I have wild beasts. I will throw you to them unless you change your mind. And Polycarp said, call for them. For the repentance from better to worse is a change impossible for us but it is a noble thing to change from that which is evil to righteousness. Do you hear what he just did? He's standing there in the stadium. They said, we're gonna kill you. We're gonna send out wild beasts to eat you alive. And he said, go ahead and get them. 
He said, I'm not going from the better thing of allegiance to Christ to a worse thing, reviling him. He said, but it would be a way better thing if you moved from what is evil to what is right. Do you hear what he's doing? He's pleading with them for their soul while they're talking about how they're gonna kill him. There's a calm to him, a confidence to him, and a compassion in him. And that's meant to mark the Christian. That's how we do. So the world marveled a few days ago after the massacre in Charleston. Young man came into a prayer meeting at a church, killed nine people. White kid, white supremacist kid, murdering nine black people. In our culture, there's such an us versus them mentality on, on so many issues. Whatever the issue is, we tend to siphon off, build silos, and throw bombs at each other. This would have been such an easy place to do that. So much room for anger. And some of that anger is justified. But a lot of room to be hateful. And so it was confusing. And it was amazing to watch it on the news. And you can watch the video on YouTube at the bond hearing of this young man. They pull him out there at his bond hearing and they pull out the members of this family, these nine people that died. They pull out family members and they said, you're allowed in this moment to speak to the court and I would beg you, go watch the video. The first person who steps up, this dear woman speaking to this young man, she says to him, less than 24 hours later, she says, I forgive you. I forgive you. And then she says, God forgive you and God have mercy on your soul." The next young man gets up and he says, I want to say the same thing. I forgive you. And he says, but I want to add to that, repent. He says, repent. And then he says, give your life to the one that matters most, to Jesus, and you'll be okay. That's what he says to him. He says, and you'll be something better than you are now. Do you hear what he's doing? He's pleading with the young man for his soul. The guy that killed his family members and he's pleading for him. Repent from what you're doing. There's no way to win here. But he doesn't say, so you're gonna burn in hell, son. What does he say? He says, so repent, kiss the son, come to the one that will forgive even you and make you into something more than you are now. And all of them, all nine family members that stand up said the same thing. And you saw people marvel at it. One uh, a news reporter quoted out to it. He said, I am not a Christian, but this is the best advertisement for Christianity I've ever seen. Another one said, these people are either lying, they're crazy, or they are beautiful. And he wasn't sure which one. The world marvels at that. And that is normative Christianity. That we don't fear, we don't get angry, we have compassion because we are confident our king rules, he reigns. And when we were sinners, he came for us. And so when we come to sinners, we don't come with anger, we come with pleading for their soul, kiss the sun because blessed are those who take refuge in him. So how does that relate to the Supreme Court decision, to homosexuality? I can't do justice to that in 10 minutes. I can't do justice to that in a whole sermon. And the truth is, I'm grateful that Ken is doing a video for Faith Bridge as a church. We're looking at Breakaway to do a longer treatment for our people uh, because I think it's important to address all the issues. I really do. And it's too nuanced a thing to talk to everybody because so many camps, so many different sides. But what does the Christian do? How do we react to what we're hearing? Well, I would say this. From the Christian perspective, some people will say, I, I don't understand why you care about who has sex with who or who marries who. Who cares? Like, just why is this an issue for you? And, and one thing I would say is important to us is for the Christian our allegiance is to a king. That's how we see it. It's to a king. And so we look at Jesus and we have to respond to him. And he does something interesting in the Gospel of Mark. You can read it. Jesus' first sermon, it says that he came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying that time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. That was his first sermon, and it said he went around the region preaching it. Listen to what that sermon was. He says the time is fulfilled. What he means by that is history has reached its culmination right now because the kingdom of God is here. Why? Because I'm here. That is a wildly arrogant way to start a sermon. I mean, can you imagine if I walked out here and said all of history is being fulfilled right now on this stage at Faith Bridge because I have arrived? You know, who the hell do you think you are? 
That's how Jesus' ministry started. He came out and said, I'm not some moral teacher. I'm not like, hey guys, I got this kind of cool illustration. He's saying, I'm the king of all this. I rule all this, which is a supremely arrogant thing to say, unless it's true. And he says, I'm the king. And then what's the next thing he says? Repent. And he says it to everyone. It says he went around Galilee. He wasn't just saying it to some parts of Galilee. You know what I'm talking about. It says he went to everybody and said, all of you repent. Everybody's going the wrong way. All of humanity is heading the wrong direction. Everybody is doing whatever they want. I'm the king of my little kingdom. Every single one of us is confronted by the gospel of Jesus. Everybody. If the sin in you is not offended by the gospel, you're not hearing it right. Listen to Jesus preach. Read through the gospels. Whenever Jesus preaches a sermon, if everyone agrees with him, he keeps preaching till they get angry enough to want to kill him. He always does. Because the true gospel of Jesus offends us because we're all rebels in heart. And so he calls us repent, turn, all of us going the wrong way. All of us must turn and come to the sun. And then he says, repent and believe the gospel. That word means good news. He says, my arrival changes everything and everyone's life has to change. And that's good news. There's blessing in it. That's how he starts. And then as he begins to talk, you get places like Mark 7 where they're talking to him about how one gets defiled and becomes unclean. And they say, hey, your disciples are eating without washing their hands. Does that make them spiritually unclean? And he says, no, you don't get unclean before God by what you're putting in your body. It's what comes out of here that's the problem. And his disciples say, what are you talking about? And he says, the problem is the bentness is in our hearts. There's a brokenness in all of us that's led all of us astray. That's the problem. And he tells them, for out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. He says, all of us have a world of evil in us. And right in the center of that list, he puts the word sexual immorality. That's the word pornea. We get the word porn from it. It's kind of a, a junk drawer term that means any, any expression of sexuality outside the boundaries God's ordained. It's a big term. It's a term that I would dare say encompasses everybody in this room. Because as Jesus is asked about marriage in Mark chapter 10, Matthew 19, the Pharisees come to him and they ask him about divorce. Who can get a divorce? Why? And Jesus begins to talk to them and he says, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. What God has joined together, let no man separate. Therefore, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. If she divorces her husband, marries another, she commits adultery. He goes on. And he does something interesting. He says, the institution of marriage rises from God's creation of gender. That's, that's where he comes from this. He says, from the beginning, God made male and female. Therefore, the man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. He says, what started was the, creating the distinction of male and female, sexual beings. And I've in, created them to enjoy that communion, that oneness, not just sexually, but physically, emotionally, financially, all of it, within a covenant of marriage forever. So I've created them this way to enjoy this covenant. I'm bracketing in sexuality to monogamous relationship, husband and wife forever under this covenant. And he puts it in such a narrow box, their sexual expression, that it scandalizes the religious people of the day. They say, I they say it's better not to get married. They say that's a very hard rule. And Jesus' answer to that is, there are eunuchs who've been so from birth, eunuchs who've been made eunuchs by men, and eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who's able to receive this receive it. He starts talking about celibacy. He says, I created sexuality. I've created a place for it to be enjoyed. Any expression of it outside of that place is not an option that's okay with me. So it's either celibacy or the enjoyment within that covenant. And let me tell you something. Let's just be honest in here. Everybody in here, other than the babies, 
have had thoughts, feelings, fantasies, desires, activity that comes outside of that box. If Jesus' vision of sexuality is a straight line, everyone in here is bent. You're all perverts. <laughs> and so am I. Everyone here. So when people start wagging their finger at this king against that king, we're all rebels, man. That's the gospel. The gospel is we're all rebels and God has mercy. But when we come to Christ, for some people he says, well, what do you care about sexuality or whatever? We go, I, I don't get to vote. He's a king. It's not a democracy. So I come and go, okay, your sexual framework is hard. It's hard for everybody. No one gets to do whatever they want. It, it's hard. And yet I believe that within that difficulty is blessing. I believe that. And so we come to a king, and we're constrained by the king. That's how the Christian feels. We don't just go, well, here's the rules. We go, no, we're, we're constrained by a king. And yet, for those who want to get angry at everybody that's outside of that, I think the media wants to create and, and is already pushing the story of the gay community versus the Christian community. And that is not our story. That is not our story. The story is everybody's a rebel. Everybody. And yet the king is rescuing those who will come to find refuge in the king. And so those who know the king, how do we engage the world? We do it the way the king did, with compassion. With compassion. Because we know what it is to struggle. We know what it is to find difficulty. Maybe all our struggles are different, but we know what it is to be in a struggle and to be rescued by the king. So we come with compassion. That's what Jesus did. So he went to the Samaritan woman. Big cultural wall put between the Jews and the Samaritans. We do not associate Let's silo off, throw bombs at each other. We hate each other. That, that propensity in America for all different issues was there in that day. And what did Jesus do? He walked to Samaria on purpose. And he sat down with that woman. And he said, can I have something to drink? And the implications of him doing that were so loud for her. She never even answers the question. She never gets him a drink of water. We don't know if she ever gave him a drink of water. Like, we don't know if outside scripture he came back around and was like, no, seriously, I'm, I'm actually really thirsty. <laughs> because the fact that someone from his camp would walk through the barricades and walk up to her and have a normal human conversation was so crazy. He says, can I have a drink? And she says, what are you doing talking to me? But that's our king. And so the world wants us to silo off and all become enemies. That's not how it works, man. Not for the people who love Jesus. I don't care what somebody's in, a part of, believes, whether they're animosity against whoever or not, whatever our issues are. He's kind and compassionate, and that's what the people of the king are like. Rosaria Butterfield wrote a great book. She was a lesbian feminist professor and... Uh, wrote a, an article against promise keepers. This was years ago. And it was sort of your typical what you would expect from two camps that silo off, mad at each other. And so she wrote this article as a feminist against promise keepers, that Christian men's movement. And so she got a ton of letters back. People from her camp going, yeah, get them. And people from the other camp, the Christian one going, you, are, it's coming for you, and kind of angry, violent. And then she got one letter from a pastor that was like, hey, I read your article, you made some good points. I'm curious where some of your presuppositions come from. Would you want to like grab coffee and visit or talk? I'd love for you to meet my wife and I. We'd love to cook you a meal. And, and she had it on her desk, the I love you pile because I'm with you and I hate you pile because I'm against you. And she didn't know where to put his letter. So she put it in the middle by itself. And then she finally went and met this pastor and his wife and they had dinner together. And they just talked about each other's lives and their stories. They had a normal human conversation that expressed dignity to both parties. That's what Jesus did when he said, can I have a drink? He expressed, I value you and think you have something to offer. And let's sit and have a conversation that's civil. And that's what happens. And that's what happened here. And she developed a friendship with these pastors, something that the world is not even creating a category for. And I just hope that this will be a church and we'll be a people that do that. We don't need to wing a bomb on, online socially or whisper them in our dark corners. We need to say, hey, everybody knows what it is to struggle before Christ. Everyone knows what it is to struggle in Christ. So I am calm and confident because I have a king. I don't need to lash out in anger or fear. 
but I'm compassionate because I know what it's like. And so I can be kind, I can be gentle. That's what our king did, and that's what we do. Let me pray for us. Lord, I just, I just pray that uh, my mind is on the person that isn't part of the political battles, isn't part of the you said, you said, all that drama, but they're sitting in here and they're struggling deeply with sexual desires that, that, that they don't have a category for and say, okay, if I, if I say I'm on board with Christ and these desires are wrong, what do I do with that? If I go and indulge him, I can't be with Christ. Like, what, what do I do with that? And there's a conflict. And I think so often in that conflict, a fear comes in that the Christian people are not safe to have this conversation with. And Lord, I just, I repent of that. And I want us to repent of that. I pray the world would be confused by how gracious we are. If the family members of murdered men and women can be gracious to the murderer in less than 24 hours. We can be gracious to people we disagree with politically or socially. That's, that's, that's the hallmark of the kingdom. And I just pray this would be a place where all of us would feel free to discuss, here are my struggles, here's what I'm believing, here's what I'm wrestling with, and I pray for a context of grace where we can speak truth. I pray that would be true of all of us. I pray for civility and compassion because we have confidence in our king. We know he rules. We know he reigns. We don't have to freak out and fear, anger. But we do call out to the world in compassion, come to know him. There are constraints in knowing him for all of us. Nobody gets away free from that. All of us have to repent. All of us find constraints, and yet those constraints bring freedom, paradoxically enough. In losing our life, we find it. That's what we've discovered. So may we be gracious, may we be truthful, and may the world marvel at, be confused by, and attracted by Christians who model the compassion of their king. And we pray that in his name. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken. As he mentioned at the beginning of Ben's sermon, he is here to answer any questions that you may have or that have been sent in um, about Friday's ruling. Um, first of all, what a great message from Ben on really, Psalm 2 and really just um, very applicable and such a good reminder of just God's sovereignty and the peace that we can find in any of these yeah. um, times. Um, what, what were your thoughts? Yeah, well, I totally agree. It was such a well-placed sermon, well-timed sermon coming at the heels of the Supreme Court ruling. And what I particularly loved is how he kept taking our eyes back to the king who stands sovereign above all the chaos. Take your eyes off the chaos and put it on to Christ the king who is our standard and who says, now lined up against me, all of you are bent. All of us are. And, um, but the good news is, that I've come that you can have life and bring your lives into conformity with me and my word. The response, and he hit this also, I thought so nicely, was, uh, the, is for the Christian, love and compassion. Mm. That's our response, which is I think particularly important because I have some Christian friends who are very, very upset and this is, uh, a, a very emotional thing for them and they're ready to throw things and shout and this sort of thing. And I, and I just really liked how he reminded us, no, 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 that's not our response. That's never been the Christian response. The media would love to portray Christians as bigoted, as hateful, and as all of that. And, and that's where we have the opportunity to put our eyes on the king and say, no, that's, we're gonna rise above that, that's not, mm who we are, that's not how we respond, um, you know, to, to, the, to the situation. And this is particularly important because many of our friends right here in our community, right here in our church, 
are still drawing their cues more from culture than from God's word. Mm -hmm. And so this is an opportunity for Christians. You know, what we're seeing is this uh, mirroring of the Christian worldview and the American worldview, which have synchronized so much for the last decades and couple of centuries, really. The tectonic plates are shifting and uh, this gives a Christian really opportunity like we've never had to really let our lights shine, mm. to respond with love, to respond with compassion uh, and grace to people who aren't going to, you know, draw their cues from God's word, but are looking to culture or looking to the Supreme Court and saying that must be the way that we're supposed to, to, to go. But I, I would also um, say for the Christian, it's important for us to remember our response is not fear. It's not, 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 not fear. It's faith. Um, Paul was always writing letters when he was being persecuted for his faith. And he was writing mostly to people who were being persecuted. And what would he say? He would say, hey, rejoice in the Lord mm -hmm. always. Again, I say rejoice. Let all people know your forbearing, your patient spirit. Why? Because the Lord is at hand or the Lord is coming back soon. The Lord is in control. Therefore, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and then you're going to experience the peace that surpasses all understanding that will guard your heart, hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And we have the opportunity to live that. Mm. Great. What a, what a great encouragement to us. Um, looking through the questions that were sent in um, from Faith Bridgers, um, I think this, what does this mean for Faith Bridge is what sure. everyone really yeah, wants to know right. is how does this decision affect Faith Bridge as a church? Well, right. And the, the short answer is it, it doesn't change anything. Um, governments will come and governments will go, will go, go, but ultimately our authority is Christ and his word and that's not changing. And um, so our definition of what makes a marriage no more comes from the Supreme Court as our definition of, of what makes a disciple. Um, the Lord already gave us that. So we continue to, uh, to live by that truth with a s smile on our face, with hope in our heart, uh, with compassion and love uh, towards everyone. So the mission of Faith Bridge and what we're doing here doesn't change, no. although we may be seeing a slight shift in our mission field the or... May, well, but the field has been changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, you, you, the, the, all of the, the Supreme Court decision did was officialize something that has been happening in culture for several decades. Uh, but I guess you could say officially the, 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 the mission field has shifted uh, on us. But again, I think this is a good thing because it is separating the church from America. And for so long, Christians have had the luxury of sort of, we've just been wrapped up in the flag and the Christian ethos and the Christian worldview and, and the biblical worldview mirrored Americanism so much. But now we're actually getting some opportunity to stand up and to say, now we're distinct from culture. Now it's not as distinct or as dangerous as in other parts of the world where Christians are being beheaded and other worse things for their faith. It's, it's not that, but there is this shift that's happening that's calling the Christian to stand up and say, hey, I'm gonna rejoice in the Lord always. Okay, so let me ask you one more question. What does that mean about Faith Bridge and our wedding policy? Well, it, it means nothing's going to change. Uh, we've always been committed to the biblical view of marriage uh, God bringing two people, a male and a female, together in, in holy matrimony, and, and that's what we'll continue to do here. Okay. So that answered a lot of the questions that came in because 
most people want to know how does this affect us as a church, but then there's another piece to that too is how does that affect the individual Christian? How does that affect me as an individual? Sure. Well, a couple of thoughts. I think it's important for all of us as Christians to remember, and Ben said it so nicely, lined up against Christ, the King, the Gospel, we're all bent. And so the issue of homosexual marriage is just one of a long list of uh, ways that people are, are that we're bent. Uh, we're bent with greed. Mm -hmm. We're bent with uh, pride, with envy, with lust. Uh, plenty of heterosexual people are bent with uh, addictions to pornography or adultery. Uh, single people are bent uh, towards fornication uh, with people that they're not married to. It, it, there's just all sorts of, of, you know, bentness and gossip and, you know, on and on and on. And so I think we have to be careful to make sure that we're, we're as Christ followers, not trying to create some sort of totem pole where at the top of the totem pole is homosexuality as, as if, you know, well, if you had some sins that were a little lower on the, bent is bent. Mm. Sin is, is sin. And, and so I think that's an important frame of mind to have uh, going in first. After that, I think it's important uh, for us to remember that we're responding with compassion, we're responding with love, we're responding full of faith, and even quietly um, saying, thank you, Lord, that we're getting an opportunity to be distinct. I mean, Jesus himself did say, now look, there's gonna be trouble in this world that you're gonna have in John 18. Uh, and he was right, and he promised uh, the world's gonna hate you. And that may be some of your friends are gonna hate you as well in Matthew 10, 22 and John 15, 18. He wasn't mistaken, he had it right. Um, and the Apostle Paul wrote in the final days, uh, there's going to be disobedience, there's going to be sacrilege, 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. He was right. And so the events of today are only proof that God's Word is true. And so there again, we're drawn back to rejoicing and saying, okay, that's true. And if those things are true, then so are the promises that someday He's going to come back, He's going to return. and make all things right. And um, so I think it's important for us as Christians to re remember as the author of Hebrews, um, sort of spent a lot of time on towards the end of the book and First Peter as well, we're, this world is not our home. Mm -hmm. We're just strangers and aliens. We're just passing through. The problem is we get so comfortable and so interwoven into this world that we really think all of this is the most important thing. It's it, and and that's where something like this reminds us. Oh, that's right. This world is not my home. Um, I'm part of a different kingdom. I'm passing through for however many years I have here on earth, but I'm part of a different kingdom, um, with a different king, um, and with the truth that he gives, and we align ourselves uh, with that. And while we're here, we're continued to call to make more and stronger disciples That's right. who make more and stronger, and stronger disciples. disciples. So and nothing bring, changes bring, about that. Bring others along. Our mission doesn't change. Mission We've always been in the business of helping lost people find their way back to God, of making more and stronger disciples who make more and stronger disciples. And you know, let me answer a question that did not get uh, sent in, but I know resides in the hearts of people in a church our size. What about the person who is a faith bridger, who loves Jesus, and who struggles with same-sex attraction. Let's talk about that just a minute, because I can only imagine the, uh, the tension um, th that you're feeling if that's who you are, because here you have shouting in one ear culture, uh, green light, green light, it's all within limits, in bounds, not out of bounds anymore, and yet you carry enough of the gospel and God's word 
and and so you you you're saying how do I live with this tension? I think this is where we have to go back to to reminding ourselves. Okay, I'm going to look to the King, who stands over all this, and His Word that uh, guides us. And it's not ever been culture that tells us in bounds and out of bounds. It's always been God's Word, um, and so we adjust our bentness to his word, regardless of what the government says is okay or not okay. Pastorally, I'd wanna make sure that any person with those feelings would hear me say loud and clear, stay at Faithbridge, don't leave Faithbridge. Um, Faithbridge is a church full of bent people and all of us are real people, real life, struggling with hurts, habits, and hangups, and trying to bring our lives into alignment um, with his word and living into the fullness of the gospel and allowing his sanctifying grace to be uh, worked into us daily. And so stay and be in community and, and be real about that. And let's run the good race and fight the good fight mm -hmm. for all of the hurts, habits, hangups, bentnesses that all of us uh, have here at Faith Bridge. You know, you brought up that question that wasn't wasn't asked, and I also can think about another question um, for those of us who have really close friends, friends, personal like family members, um, just knowing that. Um, they will get married, and we still love them, and sure. we support them. How do, how do we how do we balance that? Sure, yeah, right. And even I was talking to somebody yesterday who said, "I know now uh, I'm going to be invited to my you know relative, brother, sister, what cousin, whatever it was, wedding. Do I go or do I not go?" I would say in a heartbeat, go. Why would I say that? Because um, for us to be light in this world of darkness, for us to be salt um, and let our light shine and all these sorts of things, we, we have to be with people regardless of what it is that is their bentness. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the relationship, you, you don't have any hope of trying to get God's uh, truth and grace and the gospel and everything into them always prefer the relationship. So, uh, so don't lead with, uh, you know, one certain bentness, like the totem pole thing we were talking about. It's like, well, you know, if you were a few wrongs down here, I could go to your wedding, but I'm not gonna, I think you go. And somebody said, even a little while ago, well, what would you say? I'd say, I love you. You're my friend and I want good for you and I want flourishing for you and I want blessing for you. I still don't think that you're gonna get it the way that you're trying to because you're swimming against the current of God's um, word. But I love you and I want us to continue to have uh, this relationship. Um, the question then is asked, well, okay, if I'm a baker, do I bake the cake? If I'm a videographer, do I take the video? If I'm a this, you know, I think I, I could try to be a Pharisee and say, well, this is in bounds and that's out of bounds and no, you can't, but you can do that. I, I, I think this is where all of us are gonna have to pray and wrestle and say, okay, God, um, what is your will for me in this situation? Um, th these are interesting times. <laughs> um, the tectonic plates are, are sh shifted and are shifting. Um, how do I let my light shine? How do I live in this world, but not be of the world? Uh, but I have to be in the world. I can't pull away and have hopes of, of impacting anybody's life. And so I think this is where individually we'll just have to, to pray and wrestle and seek God's guidance on a case by case sort of situation. And I think what you said there is is key, the relationship, and to make more and stronger disciples, who make more and stronger disciples, you we have, have to, to have, be in the world. Yeah. We have to be you in have relationship, to have relationship with people. And yeah, so I remember uh, a professor saying years ago, um, Christians would love it 
if we could catch clean fish. Mm. There's no such thing. We all are fish that have to be cleaned. And so we enter in and regardless of, of you know, where the fin is and, and whatever it is, we enter in and we love and we serve and we hold the truth and we don't shout and we don't throw things and we smile and we're gracious and we're compassionate and we're sowing seeds uh, to get the gospel and the hope and the good news of Jesus into them. Great. Well, I think that definitely for me answers a lot of questions and um, just encouraging to hear your heart and God's heart and Faith Bridge's heart for, um, for people. And mm -hmm. so um, thank you for your honesty and transparency sure. and sitting down here today. And um, thank you for joining us here for Postscript. I'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.